And now let's talk about tonight's uh, tonight's topic. Uh, I, I, I've long wanted to learn more personally about the, the Los Angeles River as a kind of a transplant here. And preparing for tonight's interview, I geeked out on some river information just to get a sense of the LA River, you know, compared to some other ones. And boy, I got to say, the LA River is not that impressive as rivers go compared to some of the great ones in the world anyway. Like uh, I crunched some numbers and it turns out the amount of water the LA River dumps into the ocean each year is about the same amount that the Amazon does every 15 minutes. So it's not a, not a big place. Uh, the Nile River is the longest river in the world. It's about 4,000 miles long. The LA River is barely 1% of that. Uh, you could argue that the prettiest headwaters of any river, at least in the US, is the Colorado. It's way up in the, the Rocky Mountains. It turns out the starting put, point of the LA River is, and I'm not making this up, it's literally across the street from the In-N-Out Burger in Canoga Park. So, you know, it's, it's maybe doesn't hit the top of a lot of people's lists. Maybe it leaves a lot to be desired. You know, it's encased in concrete. It's visually, it's not exactly the Blue Danube. It's kind of closer to like, I don't know, Mad Max or Terminator. But that doesn't mean there isn't still a lot to love about the LA River. There's sections of it that, uh, as we hear at Pasadena Audubon, know, it attracts some great birds, particularly in the winter. And there, there are parts that if you happen to get caught in a traffic jam at the right spot you can look off to one side and see a, a beautiful green verdant stretch of riverway there uh which all, all this leads us up to uh the friends of the los angeles river the organization that since 1986 has been the leading group here in the area fighting to clean up the river to restore it to its natural state and to get angelios to appreciate and maybe even love the los angeles river so we're thrilled tonight to be joined by Maria Valencia. She's the Education and Programs Manager for Friends of the Los Angeles River. She's going to tell us all about the river, its past, and its potential futures. Uh, a quick reminder, if you have uh, questions or comments, you can uh, put them in, the, uh, in the, 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 the chat area here on Zoom, and we'll have a question and answer period uh, after, after, after the presentation. Also, uh, we're recording this tonight, and... and, and Thanks, thanks very much to uh, the folks at uh, the Los Angeles River and, and Maria for, for letting us record it. It'll be up on uh, our websites uh, in, in the coming days. And I, I guess uh, that's about it. Uh, Maria Valencia, let me hand it over to you and tell us all about the LA River. Awesome. Thank you so much, Chris, for that wonderful introduction. And thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be here uh, with Audubon. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. It actually looks like I might not have permission to do that. Could I possibly um, get co-host permissions? So yes, can... uh, pardon me, Maria, go no ahead. Worries. It should be fine now. <laughs> Perfect. Oh, there it goes. All right. Cool. So my name is Mireya Valencia or Maria, um, and I am the Education and Programs Manager at Friends of the LA River. Uh, and I jot jotted down my email here in case anybody wants it, and I will also leave it at the end. Uh, and today we're going to talk all about the LA River. We got a pretty good introduction from Chris here. Uh, so I always like to start out asking... Um. Um, how many of you have been to the LA River? So if your camera's on, you can just raise your hand. If not, maybe type in the chat box, yes or no, if you've been to the LA River. And let's see. Cool, I'm getting a, a lot of yeses. I wouldn't expect uh, anything less of um, birders. So yes, I'm sure you've all been to the LA River. Awesome. Well, it's very different when you ask, I work a lot with students, um, when you ask students or if you ask the average Angelino uh, if they've been to the LA River before, most of them will say no. Uh, and most of them imagine this, uh, what they see off the side of the freeways, what we've seen in movies, it's this concrete channel. A lot of people don't even know that it's a river. Uh, it just looks like a freeway to the average person if they don't know that it's a river. 
But uh, like Chris mentioned, there are plenty of natural, not plenty, there's three spots of the LA River where um, it's more natural, it's more green, there's trees, there's lots of animals. And we'll talk about why, how and why uh, these areas came to be because it's a pretty interesting story. Um, so the LA River is more than meets the eye. Um, and we're gonna learn all about it today. So I wanna take us back uh, hundreds, thousands of years. The LA River was home to indigenous people. There were Native Americans that relied on the river for survival. They didn't get everything from the river, but if they wanted to, they could get everything that they needed to survive from the LA River. Uh, and there's multiple groups uh, in this area. So the one we hear about a lot is the Tongva Gabrielino, uh, AKA Gabrielino. But there's also the Tataviam, which um, are more of the San Fernando Valley and the Santa Clarita Valley. And um, there's the Tongva and there's also the Gabrielino Quiche. And those are distinct uh, tribes that don't really associate with one another. Uh, and then there's also the Chumash, which is, um, pretty popular, a lot of people know of the Chumash, but they are more like starting in Malibu area um, and West. So they're not really in this area. Uh, I just like to show this image. This is an image of the, the names of different villages of the indigenous people. And it's interesting because some of them we still have today. For instance, the Topanga, uh, Hahamangna, which we just talked about, um, which is a, a wildlife area and also a, a really cool native plant nursery as well uh, in Pasadena. Um, there's also Cahuenga, there's uh, Rancho Cucamonga. So we do see influences of um, the Tongva here today. So I always like to, you know, ask students, imagine if this you- is from, She's from Folar. This is an Audubon webinar. Hi. Um, I always like to ask students, you know, imagine if you relied on the river as your grocery store, as your pharmacy, and as your Home Depot to build things. You would probably treat it very well because if you didn't treat it well, you wouldn't have it anymore. Um, and that's something that indigenous peoples really understood and understand today. Um, and they live in reciprocity with nature. So whenever they take something from nature, they give something back um, and just lived really respectfully with nature. And I think it's something that we can all learn from. Um, and Friends of the LA River, my organization, we actually have a series of videos on YouTube where we partnered with those different tribes in Los Angeles. We've done pretty much all four um, and we made videos with them and we want to continue building a partnership with these indigenous tribes. So I, I recommend just typing Friends of the LA River onto YouTube uh, and you'll be able to watch these videos and hear directly from um, indigenous people, which is really awesome. So Native Americans were living in harmony with nature, taking only what they needed, seeing nature as a relative. Um, and all that changed when colonizer arrive, colonizers arrived, um, debated when, I think as early as 15, 1600s, likely the 1700s, they arrived in uh, Southern California and they wanted to grow crops and they also wanted to spread their religion. Uh, so this image is a drawing, so it's obviously not a real image. Uh, it's a drawing of what somebody, of someone's, um, of what somebody thought this time period would look like. So as you can see, we have the Spanish mission in the back, and we also have the Tongva uh, village in the front. And what's interesting about this image is there's actually, you can see a little river uh, going, a little river stream right there. Um, and this just shows how important water and rivers were for not only Native Americans, but also colonizers and founders and settlers. Um, 
you know, most major cities are built along a river because they're important for trade, for transportation, and for all of the resources that they provide. And that was no different for the Spanish. They definitely wanted to be close to water. Uh, so obviously this is a drawing, so they probably didn't put their mission right next to the river. Uh, but what's interesting is you see that the Spanish put their homes very close to the river, whereas the Tongva put their homes higher up on a hill, um, farther away from the river. And this was likely because they had been here for so long, hundreds, thousands of years, whereas the Spanish had just gotten here a few years ago. So over those hundreds and thousands of years, they were able to really observe their environment and they got to know their environment really, really well. And they knew that sometimes, most of the time the river was very tame, barely has water in it, but they also knew that sometimes the river would overflow. So the Tongva had a really good grasp on their environment and they knew how to keep themselves safe from the river. This is a pretty interesting map of um, some of the founding of Los Angeles. So you can see here the river running through and it was actually right next to the original settlement of the Pueblo de Los Angeles. Um, and you can see the San Fernando mission is also very close to the Pacoima wash. Um, so there's definitely a lot of proximity to rivers here when Los Angeles was being founded. And just interestingly, the name, the original name of Los Angeles was, uh, translates to the town of Our Lady, the Queen of the Angels of the Porquincula River. So the river was always there uh, since the founding of the city. So again, the Spanish started building really close to the river. The Tongva people knew to go a little bit higher up because the river would overflow. Um, so this is an image from 1887. So you can see that we started building very, very close to the river. And this was a problem because the LA River was moody. One year it would overflow and the next year it would be completely dry. Um, and it was also known to completely change directions. So one year it would be flowing and empty into Long Beach like it does today. And then another year would get so much rain that it would just completely change directions and flow somewhere else. So as you can imagine, um, this was a, a, oops, not sure what happened there. Uh, as you can imagine, this became a pretty big problem as the city continued to grow. So I'm actually going to play a video here. It doesn't have sound, but it just has some pretty cool footage of uh, these big floods. Okay, so I'll stop it there. But yeah, as you can see, um, it was a huge flood. Houses were destroyed. Cars were flooded. Uh, this is an image of a house in Highland Park, I believe. So that would be the Arroyo Seco. Um, but yeah, like Chris mentioned, you know, the output of the Los Angeles River today is not a lot. So it can be pretty shocking to see that much rain. Uh, but I have heard, and don't quote me on this because I haven't fact checked it, but I heard that during this year, and it wasn't just this flood, this was happening, uh, it was flooding pretty frequently in years prior as well, but this was kind of the worst one. Um, 
it's said that during this flood, the out the discharge of the LA River was actually the same as the discharge of the Colorado River, which is a way bigger river, a continental watershed. Um, so it was a lot of water that was flowing through the LA River, um, being such a small river normally, having such a low capacity normally. Um, and you know, we think of LA as this very dry place, but a lot of that is because we concretized the river and we confined the river. Um, in fact, you know, we've all heard La Cienega, a name of a street. La Cienega in Spanish actually means swamp. So LA used to be actually very muddy and swampy until we um, concretized the river. So the city of LA was starting to grow more and more. Uh, the city decided that they needed to do something about the river because they couldn't keep growing the city if it kept flooding and destroying houses every year. So there were a few proposals uh, during this time. The first proposal or one of the proposals was by the Olmsted brothers, who I believe are the sons of Olmsted Sr. who designed Central Park. So they come from a family of park planners and they came up with this elaborate park system called the Emerald Necklace. Um, and their idea was to build a network of parks all along Los Angeles and even, you can't see it on this image, but even the Channel Islands they designed. Um, so yeah, very elaborate. So all of those, I'll zoom into it here as well. So all of those green parts uh, were supposed to be parks. And I think the red was supposed to be like desert corridors or I'm not completely sure. Uh, but as you can see, it's an elaborate series of parks. Um, so you might be wondering what the heck does parks have to do with flooding? Well, the idea was that, you know, it would rain and instead of houses being destroyed by water, the water would be diverted onto these parks. And, you know, maybe the park would be closed temporarily, but nothing serious would happen to the park. The trees would get some water, um, might even become some little temporary lakes for the animals. So there would be a lot of benefits to creating these parks and allowing the parks to absorb the water and also put it back down into the groundwater, which is really important so that we can use it for later. So there would have been many, many benefits to building this park system. But there was also another plan on the table at the time. And this plan was by the US Army Corps of Engineers and they proposed a flood control channel, um, which was essentially building high concrete walls so that the water would not overflow the walls. So as you can imagine, um, the city decided to go with the uh, flood control channel idea and it had devastating effects on the river. Uh, it even took a while for the river to be re-recognized as a river because it was designated as a flood control channel, um, which we had to fight to get it re-designated as a river so that we can have um, more help and more benefits. So yes, so they chose the flood control channel idea. Um, mainly I've heard because they thought it would be cheaper uh, than the park plan because parks uh, require, you know, infinite maintenance. Um, so they decided to go with the channelization, the concretization, um, which was not an easy endeavor at all. It took 20 years for them to fill up the entire river with concrete, took 17,000 employees, 3 million barrels of concrete and over 800,000 dump trucks of soil. So even though to them, it was the easier option, it was by no means um, easy or simple. Sorry, I'm getting a little bit glitchy here. Um, yeah, so that leaves us to where we are today, which is the present day LA River. These are images of the river that most that most people imagine when they hear the LA River. So that's a little bit of the history 
Um, now getting into some other facts. So where is the LA River? So the LA River, as Chris mentioned, um, does start in Canoga Park. Um, out in the valley, it traverses through the valley um, into Glendale, around downtown LA, and then it ends in Long Beach. And the LA River is 51 miles long. And what's really interesting about our river as well is that it's very steep compared to a lot of other rivers. For instance, if you think about the Mississippi River is very long and has almost no elevation change. Whereas the LA River is only 50 miles, it's very short um, and it has very, very steep elevation change, which causes the water to move a lot faster down the river. And as I mentioned, the LA River is connected to the ocean. It is connected to Long Beach. So right here on the left, you can see the very end of the LA River, and then it goes into the Pacific Ocean. So uh, I mentioned before that not all of the LA River is entirely paved over with concrete. And if you've been to the LA River, you've probably been to one of these special locations, which we refer to as the soft bottom locations, um, which is another way of saying a natural soil bottom. So there is soil on the bottom instead of concrete. But if you look closely at this image, you actually see that there is some concrete right on the side. Um, and that's because they tried to put concrete in these areas. They tried in many, many times to put concrete in these three areas. They were not just being nice and they weren't like, oh, we'll just leave three areas natural. No, they tried and they wanted to put concrete in the entire thing. But in these three areas, there was too much groundwater. So groundwater is that water that's underground. Uh, there's a diagram of it here. It's where we get, you know, we have aquifers and wells. Uh, well, we don't have a lot, but um, you can get water and drink it potentially from groundwater if it's recharged. Um, so in these three areas, there were some natural springs um, and there was too much groundwater. And as you might know, uh, concrete needs to be dry in order to harden. It starts out wet and then it dries and hardens. So if the concrete was never able to dry because there was too much water. So that's what happened. They tried to pour concrete there, but there was simply too much water. And they even tried and waited for summer for it to dry up, but there was still just constantly groundwater underneath. So they were never able to, um, to have these areas completely concrete, but there is concrete on the side. Um, so these soft bottom locations have so many benefits. Um, for one, they're kind of like a park. They're just a natural resource for people to go and visit for our mental health, uh, to get some exercise. Um, if you're feeling adventurous, you can even kayak. Um, at the Sepulveda Basin here, and also at the Glendale Narrows, you can kayak during recreation season, which is the summertime. But there's bike paths, um, and there's, as you all know, lots and lots of really, really cool animals that you can't see in a lot of places in LA. So there's three of these areas again. One of them is in the San Fernando Valley. It is the Sepulveda Basin, um, which we frequent a lot. We do events there. And every time I'm there, I see so many birders. Um, so I know this is a really popular birding spot. And part of the reason why is because it has so much surrounding habitat. It's not just the river, but there's also an entire wildlife area. So that gives, you know, all the animals more space and more resources to thrive. So this is a really, really special area. There's another one at the Glendale Narrows. So this is an 11 mile stretch of natural bottom um, and probably the closest to you all in Pasadena. Um, this is also a lovely area. There's a bike path here. You can see lots of birds here. 
And then lastly, there's the Long Beach Estuary in Long Beach, um, which also has a soft bottom area. So again, they tried to put concrete in all these areas, but it was not able to harden because there was too much water. So how does the LA River get water? Well, I just said one, which is groundwater. If there's any water underground, uh, it'll go up into the river. Um, the main one that people always answer first is rain, right? When it rains, all of that water, just like any other river, the rain will go into the river. Snow, uh, if it snows in San Bernardino's, it'll eventually melt and gravity will carry it down into the river. There's also tributaries, which are smaller rivers or streams that connect to the LA River. So here in this map, you can see we have quite a few. Um, we have a few in the valley, the Pacoima Wash, Tahunga Wash, uh, we have the Verdugo Wash and the Arroyo Seco, which I'm sure you are all familiar with. Uh, and then there's also the Rio Hondo and the Compton Creek. So there are lots of tributaries that connect to the LA River. Um, just like the LA River though, a lot of the tributaries were covered in concrete as well. So a lot of people don't know that there are smaller rivers either because they've also been covered in concrete. And they're just as important, right? Because anything that goes into the tributary will eventually end up in the LA River. And they were and could be also um, a haven for wildlife. Uh, this is a really interesting one. So I, I mentioned rain, that rain goes into the LA River and some of it will flow directly into the river, but most of the rain most of the rain will actually come from storm drains. So we've all seen these on the side of the road. Um, and they were designed, they were engineered so that our streets wouldn't flood. Uh, and instead, all of the water would get diverted. And if you've ever wondered where those go, um, they go directly to the LA River. So if you walk in the LA River, you can see many of these storm drains, uh, which show where those, where those drains that start on our streets end right in the LA River. So as you can imagine, when it rains, any gasoline, any fertilizer, any trash that is on our streets will also get carried into these storm drains and will pollute our waterways. So we've probably all seen this on the side of the road, no dumping drains to ocean. Well, I like to say that it should really say no dumping drains to river because all of these actually go to the river first and then the river goes to the ocean. So it's not a lie, they do go to the ocean, uh, but they go to the river first. So they have the ability to impact the river the most and bring the most pollutants to the river. So just something to think about the next time you're um, walking by and see one of these signs. So that's all great rain, snow, tributaries, uh, but that would mean that the LA River would only have water for a very short period of time in the year. It would only have water in the winter time because that's when it rains in LA. So if that was the case, it would mean that the LA River would be dry in the summertime. But if you've ever gone to the LA River in the summertime, you know that that's not the case. The LA River has a constant flow of water at all times. And that is because of these. That is because of water treatment plants, water reclamation plants. So when we um, use water in our homes, it gets sent to one of these reclamation plants. Uh, and these reclamation plants are like giant factories. Uh, they have all these crazy technology, crazy machines that clean up the water. Um, and what do they do with the clean water? In fact, it's clean enough that other countries actually would drink this level of filtered water. But in the United States, it doesn't quite meet our standards. So we do not drink it. 
if you can guess, we actually put all of that water into the LA River. So we're getting millions of gallons of water every day from these water treatment plants. So these are two of them. There's one in Glendale, there's one in by the Sepulveda Basin in Van Nuys. And then there's also another in downtown, I believe. And those are just the ones that go directly into the river. There are other treatment plants as well. But yes, all of these treatment plants um, discharge a large amount of water into the river. So it's pretty interesting because on one hand, it's a massive waste of water. Again, this is pretty clean water that if we cleaned it a little bit more, we could actually drink it. But instead, we're putting it into the river, which flows very, very quickly to the ocean. So basically, all of this water is becoming salt water in a matter of minutes, um, which is very, very silly when we could be doing so many other things with it. When we're in a drought, um, we could even be using it for plants, but we don't. And what's actually interesting is um, our, our policy person at Friends of the LA River uh, is currently working with some stakeholders because they actually want to reduce the amount of water that the reclamation plant in Van Nuys gives to the river. So they want to um, put more of that water on the ground so that it can eventually become groundwater, which is a really good idea because we would be recharging our aquifers. But what's interesting is that now the river is so dependent on this constant flow that the water treatment plants give it. So now we have animals that will just not survive if we completely stop um, giving the river water from these plants. So uh, it does have to be done very carefully. There's also recreation, there's kayaking now that would not be possible without the water that's discharged from here. So it is a bit of a complicated um, topic, but yeah, most of this water is just becoming salt water very quickly. Um, and on that note, an interesting fact is it's estimated that about 80% of our rainwater, so when we get rain, about 80% of that ends up directly into the ocean. So we get all excited when it rains, no drought, but actually most of that water is going straight into the ocean, so we're wasting that water. Um, and one way to reduce that would be removing concrete from the river and removing concrete from all parts of our city so that water can go down into the ground like the water cycle says it should. Uh, but because we put so much concrete not only in the river, on our streets, on our schools, there's not a lot of opportunity for water to go back down into the ground. So unfortunately, we do waste a lot of that water. And the LA River is part of the LA River watershed. So, oops, sorry, my cat is making noise. Um, so everywhere on earth, you're part of a watershed because water needs to flow somewhere, right? So a watershed explains how water collects, how it all joins together and how it drains. So you can think of a watershed as a bathtub. So all of the water collects in one area which is usually divided by mountains. And then all the water will drain into one place. So that's the definition of a watershed. Here in LA, we have several watersheds. Uh, one of the main ones is the LA River watershed, uh, but then there's also the Santa Monica Bay watershed. So I think watersheds are a really good way of explaining how we're all connected because what someone does in one part of the watershed affects another person in the other part of the watershed. So we're all connected within this watershed. So biodiversity of the LA River. When the LA River was wild, it had a ton of biodiversity, but obviously that has decreased um, with the channelization of the river. So just talking really quickly about native plants. Uh, the LA River used to be all native plants, but that all changed when with colonization because the Spanish brought over a lot of plants that were not normally in this area, which we call them non-native plants. 
And some non-native plants come to an area and they're, they're harmless. Other non-native plants come to an area and they become invasive. They grow very rapidly and they kind of take over and they're very bad for the environment. An example of that is black mustard, which has these yellow flowers. So you've probably seen entire hillsides of this plant, just yellow hillsides. And those are black mustard, which is an invasive plant, uh, which takes away space and water from native plants. And we like native plants because for one, they are important for the animals. Birds, there's certain birds that can only eat a specific type of native plant. And if they don't have that plant, they can't survive. Native plants are also drought friendly um, because they don't require a lot of water. Because if you think about it, native plants have been here, let's say in LA for so long that they're used to not having a lot of water. So the way that they survive without water is they actually grow really long roots and they're able to tap into that water that is underground. And that's great uh, because we have beautiful plants all year round because of these long roots. And also because if plants are wet, um, they're less likely to catch on fire. So we've seen a lot of devastating fires recently in the Sepulveda Basin. And what makes those fires worse is that there's a bunch of this dried up black mustard in the summertime. And it's dry because it doesn't have those long roots to get the water that's underground. So in the summertime, if there's no rain, it'll die. Whereas native plants can survive easier in the summertime, so they don't provide as much fuel for wildfires. So I like to give these two different examples. We have the coast live oak, which is native to California. Uh, you can see that there's acorns, which show how important it is for the ecosystem, for the animals. And I like to tell a story that I heard from some of our indigenous partners, which is that the Native Americans when, because acorns are only ripe at certain times of the year. So when they would become ripe and they would fall on the ground, the Native Americans would actually leave the acorns on the ground, even though acorns were a huge food source for them. They would actually grind up acorns and use them as food. So it was very important to them. It has a lot of protein. Um, and you could still do that if you wanted to today. Um, but they used the acorns, but they would actually leave them for the animals. And they said, let's help out the animals first, because, you know, we're actually dependent on these animals because this squirrel is going to go plant this acorn and we might have a new tree in a couple of years. So if we don't help out these animals, then we're hurting ourselves. Right. So they understood that they were interdependent on the animals. Uh, so they did that really nice thing for the, the animals. And I also like to point out, look at all the shade that this big tree provides. That's a lot of shade that can actually cool down our streets and cool down our homes um, as summers are getting more and more extreme. Compare that to our um, iconic palm tree here in LA, which is actually called the Mexican fan palm. And it is actually from certain parts of Mexico. It is not native uh, to this area. And developers actually started planting them because they thought that they looked nice and they thought that more people would want to live here if we had these beautiful trees, which is maybe true, maybe came true. But uh, if you think about it, Mexican fan palms do not provide any benefit to the animals. There are no animals that rely on this plant. And it also doesn't provide any shade, right? So there's kind of no benefits to our ecosystem because of this fan palm, whereas the coast live oak has a lot of benefits for our ecosystem. So not only are there plants, but there's also a lot of birds at the LA River. Um, so don't, don't look too closely at our field guide because uh, it was not professionally developed and I know you're all birders, but uh, this is a little guide that we give to students and we give them binoculars when we're down by the river and we have them uh, try to identify some of the birds that they see. So a really common one that we see is obviously the great blue heron, which uh, this is a video of one. But yes, a lot of migratory birds, a lot of riparian birds that 
rely on fresh water. So there's lots of really unique birds um, here, but you all are the bird experts. So I won't talk too much about the birds. But yeah, I, I can speak personally, it's just wonderful uh, to see so many awesome birds every day. Um, and working for Friends of the LA River, I've definitely come to become more of a birder and um, yeah, see, see how wonderful birding is. Uh, but there's also other animals, there's lots of fish. So the LA River used to be home to these steelhead trout. And these are really interesting fish because they actually swim in both fresh water and salt water. So they swim and they're in, in many rivers, but they swim from a river to the ocean. And then they swim back to the river to lay their eggs. And these used to be abundant in the LA River uh, and the Native Americans would eat them as a food source. Uh, but as you can imagine, when we channelized the LA River, these fish were no longer able to swim upstream. So they haven't been found in the river in a very long time. Although I have heard that there were some spotted in the Arroyo Seco, but I think that story is still developing. Um, but yeah, we call steelhead trout an indicator species because they are very sensitive. So they indicate something about our environment. They tell us something about our environment. And right now they're telling us that the LA River is not healthy because if it was healthy, then these fish would be able to survive there. But since these fish are not found there, it is we can conclude that it's not a, a healthy ecosystem. So one of our goals, we would love to see these steelhead trout brought back to the river. And there is work happening on that right now. Uh, talks of some a fish passage uh, and steelhead trout um, were important to our founder, Lewis McAdams. He said that when steelhead trout were back in the LA River, that's when we know that we did a good job and that the LA River is restored. Um, so this is Lewis McAdams. He's the founder of my organization, Friends of the LA River. He was a poet uh, and activist as well. And uh, unfortunately he passed away pretty recently. Uh, but this is a poem that he wrote that I think is kind of interesting. So I'm going to read this poem right now. It is called The Founding of Friends of the Los Angeles River. Pat Patterson, Roger Wong, and I meet Fred Fisher at the Old Challenge Dairy on Vignes Street for early morning brandies and coffee. We are on our way down to the river for the first time. We carry heavy duty wire clippers to cut through the fence beside the first street bridge, courtesy of Greg Cannon. Then we climb down the steep cement covered bank to the river. We don't know where we're going exactly. We walk upstream to where the Arroyo Seco flows into the Los Angeles. This must have been one of the most beautiful places around here once. This is covering my view. Uh, a thicket, a confluence, an avalon at the meeting of year-round streams. Deer quiver at the edge of memory. Night herons splash. There are steelhead. We don't like to look backwards. Now there are railroad tracks on both banks of the river. Two freeway bridges, the 110 and the 5 cross it. Through a tunnel where somebody is sleeping on a gray mattress in a torched VW van, the arroyo meekly flows. Cement will turn back into sand someday. Today there's 30 guys with jackhammers leveling the pavement ahead of an airport runway paving machine. It makes an unholy noise. So we address ourselves to the river. We ask if we can speak on its behalf in the human realm. We can't hear the river saying no. So we get to work. So again, that's just a poem by our late founder, Lewis McAdams. And he founded uh, Friends of the LA River, Folar, 
And it's our mission to bring the river to the people and the people to the river. So we do various things in our organization. A big part of what we do and what I uh, help manage is our education programs. So we do quite a few things. We actually have an RV, um, which we converted into a mobile museum. Um, and we will actually drive this RV and park it at different schools or different community events. And we will teach people about the LA River. Um, and then a big part of what we do as well is field trips. So we have school groups come down to the LA River. Uh, we bird and we um, do, a do a few fun activities with them. We also do community events. Um, so we've done nature walks at the river, try to educate people, bring the community out to the river. We like to invite them to the river because if you don't know how to get to the river, it can be very intimidating. So we love inviting people and exposing them to the river so that they can come back on their own. Um, this image on the left is actually an image from the Sepulveda Basin, where we've been doing monthly habitat restoration events. So we actually remove invasive mustard from the area to make room for um, all of the native plants and to help the ecosystem. Again, this is a very popular birding destination. And we actually did a study. We worked with a biologist and we did um, simultaneous bird counts at the same time that we were doing this habitat restoration work so that we could see if our habitat restoration work was having an impact on the bird populations. So that's some of the work we do. We're actually having one of these events this Saturday at the Sepulveda Basin. Oh, and we also partner with uh, San Fernando Valley Audubon. They've actually been coming out to these events and taking volunteers on bird walks um, throughout the event. So people come, we get our hands dirty, do some restoration work, and then if they want, they can also learn a bit more about the birds and, and the history of the Sepulveda Basin. Uh, one thing that we're kind of famous for is our cleanups. So we bring out thousands of people to the river um, and we'll be doing it again this summer. We give people trash bags, gloves, and we make a huge impact uh, and take out tons and tons and tons of trash from the river. So we hope to see you there this summer. Lastly, we do uh, some policy and advocacy work. Uh, so one thing we did this year was we helped collect comment letters for the LA River Master Plan, which was a document that got released by the county. Um, and it was an update from the 1996 River Master Plan. So this is, it only comes around once every so often. So it's a really important opportunity. So we were collecting comment letters um, and we sent about 500 uh, comment letters to the county. Um, and right now the project is um, actually, I was confusing it with this. Uh, so this project is currently in the DEIR phase and we also collected um, comment letters for this project. So this um, is a project right here in the Glendale Narrows. Um, and we are basically opposing a housing development um, that is going to be built, this little blue spot here. That's going to be a huge uh, housing development with 400 units. It's going to block the beautiful view of the San Bernardino Mountains, which is the least important reason to oppose this project. Um, a big reason to oppose it is because we believe it'll block off access to this huge park that is currently vacant land that is going to be turned into a park. So this huge green area um, is going to be a park and right by this development is actually the only entrance to the park. So it's going to really limit access. It's going to create traffic issues. Um, and it's also the bare minimum of affordable housing. So it's not doing anything to solve our housing crisis here. Uh, so we collected comment letters for that as well. And it's currently um, waiting response from the city. And actually recently today, we got really exciting news that um, the river 
the Army Corps of Engineers investing $28 million uh, in the LA River. So this is very, very new, um, but we're pretty excited about um, the opportunities that this can bring to the river. So that concludes my presentation. Again, there's my email if um, you'd like to get in touch. But yeah, now I'd be happy to answer some questions. Uh, uh, great, uh, thanks very much. We actually do have uh, a number of questions here. Uh, I have a question, first of all, uh, it's a simple question. Who Who's in charge of the river? Is it the city that this makes the decisions? Is it the the Corps of Engineers is the county of Los Angeles is the state who, who runs things. Yeah, there's a lot of stakeholders. Um, I would say mainly the US Army Corps has a lot of the jurisdiction. Like if you want to do an event in the channel itself, you have to go through them and get permission. So they're one of the main ones. The different um, council districts have a big say. Um, you know, you have LA Metro involved in the bike paths. Uh, you have Caltrans involved in the bike paths. Um, so there's a lot of, of different stakeholders, but the Army Corps of Engineers is one of the main ones. Okay, and they're, I mean, to paint, you know, the broad brush, they're, they're not known throughout their history for their environmental friendliness. Uh, Precisely, but, yeah. yeah. They are often seen um, spraying things and removing willow trees uh, from the bank, so... Yeah, yeah. Uh, could you talk a little bit about the 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 big master plan that you know has, it's been in the news for the last several years? I remember a few years ago, uh, famous architect Frank Gehry was asked mm -hmm. to be part of it. Could you just kind of explain what that plan is, what it what it hopes to do, and if you and your organization think it's a good idea? Yes. Um, so I I can go back just to show this image really quick. Um, so this is a really bad quality image, but basically the master plan proposes a few different ideas for what the, what the river should look like. And one of the main focuses is of these platform parks. So as you can see here, they're basically building a park on top of the river. Uh, and this is their most favored option. So this would basically be adding more concrete to the LA River instead of removing concrete. Um, there's, another, there's another option called the island, which is creating a park more inside the channel. Um, and then there's another option, which I don't remember the name of, but that's the one where they would actually remove concrete and actually um, you know, create more of an ecosystem, create more of a habitat for animals. But them focusing so much on these platform parks, which are Frank Gehry's, um, we just don't believe it'll be beneficial to the ecosystem. It's adding more concrete. And we also have concerns over displacement um, for creating, you know, parks tend to lead to gentrification as well. And we don't see that addressed in the master plan. Um, so you're welcome to, I'll actually drop the link um, to the page on our website and you're welcome to read more about why we're opposing it. Okay. Uh, uh, a question that maybe touches a little bit on the gentrification uh, about the, uh, the homeless encamp encampments that are still uh, well, quite common along, along the river. Uh, is, I, I guess my question is one is, is this something that you, you folks focus on as well, or, uh, and, or, you know, what, you know, uh, how, how do you see, how do you see that inf affecting the stuff that you're trying to do with the making the river a more natural place? Totally. It's a really great question that we get asked a lot. Um, historically, we haven't been too involved in the um, homelessness crisis, and we haven't really had any strong opinions. But we're currently doing some strategic planning and we're noticing more and more that it's something that we can't ignore. Um, so we are trying to support organizations that are already doing the work with unhoused people. So we're supporting organizations that do supplies drives and that um, you know, are on the ground with the unhoused. Um, that being said, you know, 
we're an environmental nonprofit. We can't solve the homelessness sure. crisis. Uh, that has to be solved at the roots. Um, so right now we're just doing what we can to support the unhoused population that is there. And we're seeing what we can do to get more involved in policy around homelessness in general. But yeah, that's the gist. We're not very involved, but we want to be. Um, and you know, it's it's not a matter of just kicking them out from the river. We have to make sure that they have livelihoods and that they have somewhere to go. And then we can work on, um, you know, creating a beautiful river. But yeah, it's, it's interesting, like talking about building parks, you know, and all these things. But we have we do have to solve that problem first, I believe. Uh, there's a question about the, the 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 trash that's in the river. Uh, are there any plans or ideas that you folks have for reducing the amount of trash it gets in the river in the first place, as a, you know, to save you the trouble of going down there and having to pick it all up later? Yeah, that's a good question. A lot of that is education. So we try to educate people that the storm drains are connected to the LA River. Um, and we tell students, you know, you can start in your own neighborhood. You don't even have to go to the LA River to help the LA River. You can just pick up trash that you see in your own neighborhood. Um, and that besides that, our policy team is, is lightly involved in like legislation, anti-plastic legislation the more of the, the source cause. I see. Uh, I had a question, another question uh, about the fish passage that you met, mentioned. Can you talk a little bit more? What is that? How would that work? Where would that be located? Yeah, I don't know a ton of details about the okay. fish, fish passage. Um, I would hope that it involves removing more concrete and creating more soft bottom areas so that the the water is deeper and the fish are able to swim through, but it could easily be adding more concrete somehow and, and creating a channel, but I don't know a ton of details about that fish passage. We have a, a question here that's, uh, it's a very simple question, I guess. What, what's wrong with removing uh, the concrete, at least, at least from the bottom? Uh, what, what, you know, what's the argument against like, you know, going down to say Willow Street with a near Long Beach with a bunch of jackhammers and, you know, keeping the sides of the river to, to control it from overflowing, but, but digging out the concrete and having a, a soft bottom again. What, what's the argument against it? Yeah, so there have been studies done by engineers um, to determine where we can do that, because obviously now we have so much infrastructure, so many houses built around the, the concrete channel, so we couldn't just remove all of the concrete or it would collapse. Um, so there have been studies done and actually that area near um, Casitas, near Griffith Park, that's been determined as an area where we can do a lot of concrete removal. And that's why we're opposing those platform parks because there is an opportunity there for concrete removal. But there have been studies that it, it can't feasibly be done in all 51 miles just because of the engineering. I see. Uh, I'm looking at uh, just making sure uh, if I have any other questions here. Uh, there was a question at the beginning. Somebody oh, asked, yes. um, "What what effects did the conc concretizing of the river have on local wildlife?" I guess thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, as you can imagine, if you were an animal and they just started using jackhammers in your home, uh, you would probably either die or you would go somewhere else. So that's what happened to a lot of the wildlife. Uh, they were displaced. The animals that are there today came back later, uh, but not all of them were able to come back. So a lot of the animals now are threatened or endangered. Um, yeah. Hey, I think that might do it for questions. So, uh, any, if anyone has a last minute question, uh, please post it right now. I think there's one in the chat. Okay. Uh, yeah. Post it in the chat other than, and, oh yeah, I'm, I'm sorry. 80% yeah. of LA question. concretized. I'm not sure about the stats. I don't yeah. think it's exactly proportionate to the amount of water that goes in the ocean. But I think it's probably pretty similar. I do know that a majority 
of our city is covered in concrete, but I'm not sure about the percentage. And I, um, I, I read that the San Gabriel River and the LA River are very different. They have very different geographies. So San Gabriel River is, has a lot more sandy bottom and you know, because it can, and um, they're able to have a lot of those settling ponds where we like to go look for gulls and other things. And so a lot of the water in the San Gabriel River is actually reclaimed and, and gotten back into the ground. But the LA River, because a lot of it is flowing over granite, it's flowing over hard rock. Uh, and then the, the, the development is so adjacent to the LA River, it just isn't possible to do a lot of that, getting the water back into the, into the ground. So that's why places like Hahamanga are so important because we can get the water into the ground up there, you know, before, it, you know, on its way down the Arroyo Seco. But the other river is just, it's just hard to do it there. It's just hard to do it. So that's why I think my argument is we should all be doing it at our houses. We should all be doing it. You know, every bit of public property should be bioswales and we should be capturing all that rainwater. Can't depend on a concretized river channel to do it for us. Amazing point, Laura. <laughs> and then I think there was another question. Um, Oh, yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, about there are excavation work. Um, I noticed some excavation work in the Glendale Narrows near the Griffith Dog Park a few months ago. What was going on there and who was responsible? And then somebody else asked, you know, again about the bulldozing. There is major bulldozing that goes on of habitat at Willow Street, which is as a birder, that's where we like to go look for birds. That's a top spot. Is there a better way of doing this? Do you work with the group that does this? I'm wondering if that's LA County or if that's the Army Corps. Yeah, we do get a lot of um, requests like this. We get a lot of concerns about the pollution that these groups are using, but we are not involved with these groups. Um, I would say that that's probably the, the Army Corps of Engineers uh, doing that. And, and I would say, yes, there is a better way of doing it, but we don't have any control over that. Exactly. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, Laura I, and everyone, I, I think I think that may do it for uh, tonight's talk. We just want to say thank you so much for for uh, for taking the time, and thanks for everything that your organization does. And we hope to you know we hope to see all of you down there on the river. Yeah, we we participate in cleanups, so we're you know we consider you our partners trying to keep the river. Yes, please, and yeah. my email's there if anyone would like to reach out see how we can partner more together. It's been, thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And everybody come back next month. We have another great program for you. So we look forward to seeing you then. Okay. I'm done. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Thank all. you. Good night. Thank you. Good night.